Hello, and welcome to the Master of Public Health Online Program's Student Spotlight Webinar, presented by the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. My name is Kiana Carter, and I am an Enrollment Advisor for the Master of Public Health Online Program. First, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. And before we begin, I'd like to review what you can expect during today's presentation. Now, to cut down on background noise, please mute your phone lines so as not to disturb the presenters. If you have any questions for our speakers, please type them into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and hit send. Feel free to enter your questions as you think of them, and we'll answer as many as time allows at the end of the presentation. A copy of this recording and slide presentation will be available shortly thereafter. Now here's a look at what we'll be covering. First, I will share a little bit about the university. Then we will hear from Dr. Shubha Kumar, who will introduce our speakers, Delcy Strayan, Denise Sawyer, and Dorian Satterley. Lastly, we will end the presentation with a brief Q&A session. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at USC Online MPH. Now, the Keck School of Medicine was established in 1885. It's the oldest medical school in Southern California, and today it is a place of dynamic activity in patient care, scientific discovery, medical and bioscience edu education, and community service. Together, we are poised to lead medicine and health care into the 21st century for the benefit of humankind. The Department of Preventive Medicine at Keck of the Keck School of Medicine of USC, is known as a leader in the pub public health and population health sciences. It's organized into six divisions, disease prevention and global health, bioinformatics, biostatistics, cancer epidemiology and genetics, environmental health, and behavioral research. Now I would like to pass this on to Dr. Shiva Kumar, the program director at the Master of Public Health online program. Thank you, Kiwana. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm pleased to share that uh, our former students and now alums, Delcy, Denise, and Dorian, will be presenting about the work that they've done um, during the program and since the program. So we're very thankful to have their time today and uh, their willingness to share their experience. So a little bit of background about myself. I am a faculty in the Department of Preventive Medicine, and as Kiwana mentioned, I oversee the online MPH program. My area of expertise is global health, and specifically looking at management and leadership within global health. So my background prior to academia was working with several nonprofits and NGOs, um, doing work kind of on a global scale in different parts of the world, including Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America and Caribbean regions. And uh, since I've been here at USC, I've had the pleasure of working with several of my colleagues, um, doing research with the World Health Organization, the United Nations, USAID, around sexual and reproductive health, monitoring and evaluation, and other fun topics. So we have a lot of wonderful faculty doing great research here, and of course our students who are doing great work uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our first presenter of the day, um, Delcy Strand. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. Um, let's take a look. So, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I am a former student of the MPH program at USC online, and um, I'm really excited to be here to kind of talk to you about some of my experiences. I graduated in 2016, at the end of 2016, and um, I just had the, the most wonderful experience uh, with this program, not only with the faculty and staff, but with the students and the content. And it has greatly shaped my professional experiences and um, just kind of my interest in the field. And um, I'd like to 
share that with you a little bit and see, see if there are any takeaways that might resonate with you. So my current career and my career path. Uh, first off, I have more of a background in psychology. I got my BA in psychology, uh, including a minor in education from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I actually graduated in 2010. Um, it took me a little bit to kind of figure out really what I wanted to do. I had a little bit of a stint in law school and worked in a couple different fields until I landed in this public health field and just really found my passion. Um, I started working at Shasta Community Health Center in 2012, and that was my first exposure to public health. Uh, at SCHC, I have been here for about six years now, and that's where I was really inspired to get my, my MPH. And um, we're located in far rural Northern California, and uh, it's a really small community. The whole county has about 200,000 people. The main population hub, Redding, is about 100,000 people. And SCHC, Shasta Community Health Center, is the main Medi-Cal provider for the county. Uh, as you can imagine, we have very limited educational opportunities in terms of grad school especially. So I was really thankful for the concept of online programs in general because having such limited opportunities in the area, a lot of the professionals in Reading and the surrounding communities get their degrees from this small pool of colleges, from universities. And while that's wonderful, it's great that we have those opportunities, I really wanted to get something outside of the box. I didn't want to have the same education as everybody else. I wanted to get some new, fresh ideas, a little bit more progressive, and bring them to our small community. And so I was really excited to find USC, and um, I just fell in love with the program from the get-go. And I really I got everything out of it that I wanted, and I was very, very, very am very thankful for this program because I feel like my, my level of education in the community has really uh, helped me to stand out. And um, that's really affected my career prospects, not only at SCHC, but in all of the organizations in our small community, because I know most everybody in the nonprofit world, and, and you know, they know me since we all work together on different initiatives. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the CHESS, which is the Certified Health Education Specialist, it is the national credentialing for health educators. And um, this is something that is discussed heavily in the program and something that I really wanted to pursue. So I actually got it midway through my MPH. I took the CHESS and became certified. So I was very proud of that. But even more so, last April, I qualified to take the MCHES, which is the master level certification. So I took that and I passed. So I am a newly minted MCHES. Uh, so I've kind of got that, that new certification glow about me. So still very proud of it. Uh, like I said, if you don't know anything about the CHESs or MCHESs, I recommend looking into it because it's a anybody that's really looking for that practical application in terms of health education and really getting your, your hands dirty and um, program development, program design and, and whatnot, that's, that's the way to go. Um, I have also worked quite a bit to find leadership opportunities outside of my, my day job, if you will. Uh, I serve on several boards, including the Reading Homeless Day Resource Center, and I'm a member of the Active 2030 Club of Reading, which is a service club aimed more towards uh, younger adults, young professionals. And I'm also starting a leadership, uh, leadership program, a local leadership program, uh, which is pretty, pretty prestigious locally to get into. And I feel like my MPH has not only helped me to accomplish all of these opportunities, but to really seek them out and to know about how how to make these connections and um, find these opportunities. Okay, so my practicum, uh, this is kind of a, a big thing that I took on, and uh, for your practicum you have 300 hours to pick a project, and you put those 300 hours towards this project, and I saw this as a really neat opportunity to accomplish something. Uh, I really wanted to have my practicum mean something to me, 
And I wanted it to be something that I was passionate about, and I had a hard time fitting that into 300 hours. Uh, so I kind of did, and I kind of didn't. Um, started with a needs assessment with our unsheltered population in uh, the Reading area and um, found out that we have a wonderful shelter, we have uh, domestic violence services, we have job readiness, we have clothes, we have food, we have all of these things. But what we don't have is easy access to showers and restrooms. So that is the massive project that I took on. Started looking at other programs and, and communities all over the state and the country, really, and um, came up with this mobile shower model and kind of put some information together, built some steam in the community, held a fundraiser. And the fundraiser was the official end of my practicum project. And we raised over $10,000 to hold a pilot. Uh, so I was very happy to have this money, but then I'm kind of thinking to myself, what next? Uh, the following spring, after I graduated, I continued on with the project, and we held a pilot uh, just to test out the model, see if it would work. In that time, we operated once a week on Saturdays, and we provided 369 showers to 136 individual people, and that spanned a a period of 44 service hours. So I am extremely proud of this project. It's something that I am still working on. Uh, unfortunately, in order to operate long term, we need to have a local zoning ordinance changed. So last March, I presented in front of city council to get that changed. Uh, and again, unfortunately, being such a small kind of conservative community, I wasn't able to get that support. Um, it was one roadblock, it's not, does not mean that I am done, I'm still going. So my real takeaway for your practicum, there's one thing that I can tell you is pick something that you love. When else in your life are you going to get a chance to have a passion project and have a reason to put time towards it? So, you know, you can pick a project that will get you the grade, that will meet the requirements, but you can also do that and find something that you can really make a difference and really find a passion or have a passion for. So that is my biggest takeaway. So real world application. Uh, anybody working in health education, health promotion, you will learn that health literacy is huge. This was something that my MPH didn't particularly ex expose me to it for the first time, but it really gave me this in-depth knowledge to realize just how important this topic is. Um, gave me some really important base knowledge that I used towards my chest. I've used it in my everyday work. I uh, use it with my interactions in the community. Um, it's, it's a really big thing. It's one of um, the chest certification's core requirements. So I would recommend paying attention during your health literacy section. Um, next, I highly, highly, highly recommend paying extra special attention to media and your media contacts and really fostering those connections because having media contacts can really make or break your program. Uh, they help to get information out there, and so if you help them, they can help you in the future. Like we had a big colorectal cancer push in March for Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, and I called up my friend who's a reporter, and he did a whole story on it. So we were able to take our in-house initiative and spread it throughout the community just with a 15-minute interview. Um, Kind of along the same lines, I highly recommend pay attention to networking. Network, network, network. You really just never know when a connection will come in handy. Um, and you know, it could be years down the line, so hold on to business cards, write down references, pay attention, get to know people, get people to know you. Uh, another recommendation is to help others connect even if it doesn't benefit you or your organization. So an example is we have a mental health care center in town who was trying to start up a little in-house library. 
So I connected them with my good friend, who's the director of our library, and they helped support each other's programs. It had nothing to do with me, nothing to do with my organization. But if I ever need something from that mental health care center, I've got that in. Plus, I've got, I already have that network with the library. So, you know, these are things that you're building goodwill and you're building these connections and it can benefit you when you least expect it. Okay, so my last slide, getting to know your classmates and making friends, I think is my number one tip for success and for survival here. Uh, getting to know your classmates is huge. Yeah, their names on a the screen, they might be a kind of a grainy image on a live session, but they're people, they have sense of humor, they have preferences. Get to know each other during your group projects, highly recommend that. Um, start working together and supporting each other. And I've got classmates that I'm still friends with, and um, it's wonderful. I'm going to be friends with them for the rest of my life, for the rest of my career, so I really value that. Start a Facebook group. This was a wonderful idea that one of my classmates had. She said, hey, let's, let's get to know each other. Let's start a group. And I was like, okay, sure, whatever. Didn't really think much of it. But it was honestly one of the highlights of my experience because it created this safe space where we could say, hey, you know, I really don't understand what they're asking for number three. Can you help me? Or, hey, guys, grades are up for the final. Or, um, here's a funny meme. This reminds me of our biostats homework. You know, it gives you this, this platform for you to really get to know each other. Don't be afraid to ask questions and communicate your needs. You are your own advocate. So highly emphasize that. Know your due date. Calendars really are your best friend here. Plan things out and it will make your semesters go so much easier. Get involved in professional organizations. Two big ones are APHA, which is the American Public Health Association, and SOFI, which is the Society of Public Health Education. So highly recommend those. Um, as odd as this sounds, <laughs> find, make, and invent time for fun. Uh, you can see here a funny scuba diving picture. And this was actually at about, I think this was at like midnight one night. I'm working with my classmate, Teresa. She lives up in Washington. We have never met in person, but I do consider her a good friend. And um, we, uh, we were just a little loopy. We're diving into our work. Things are getting a little crazy because we're so tired, going a little cross-eyed. And we started to have fun on Google Hangouts. So that's what that is. And so, you know, you find these chances to get to know each other and to have fun. Last but not least, I'm going to leave you, leave you with the words that I live by. This is my own mantra that got me through grad school. And if you're anything like me, you are <laughs> kind of type A. You like to do really well in things. You always want to do your best. Give 100% to everything that you're doing, and uh, that can drive you crazy in grad school if you're going to school full-time, if you're working full-time, trying to have a social life. It's a lot. So my mantra, my words to live by, <laughs> admittedly, it's a really, really corny joke, but what do you call a doctor that graduated last in his class? Doctor. <laughs> So with that in mind, you don't have to get A's on everything, <laughs> but, you know, getting A's and getting B's, it will get you the degree, and your MPH will be just as good, just as valid as your classmate who might have gotten straight A's. So keep that in mind. I wish you all well. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Find me on LinkedIn if you have any questions. But congratulations on this journey you're partaking or considering because it is so worthwhile. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Delphi, for sharing such a personal experience and uh, about your work, your tips for success. Very much appreciated. Next, I'd like to introduce Amy Sawyer, who is going to go ahead and share um, about her experience and insight. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Denise Sawyer. I'm currently a project manager on the Health Information Technology and Exchange team at the DC Department of Healthcare Finance. 
I graduated from the online MPH program in 2017 um, and did the biostat and epidemiology track. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about my career progression, uh, briefly about my practicum project from last year, um, a little bit about the work that I'm doing right now, uh, and I'm going to leave you with some thoughts about how to make the most of your grad school experience in this program. Um, so, uh, at first glance, uh, my journey into public health may seem a little bit unorthodox. Um, I did my undergraduate work uh, in political science and theater. So I ended up taking a very different path than most of my classmates. Um, during college and for some time afterwards, uh, I worked on political campaigns, uh, political action committee, and did some activism work. Um, but I really, I wasn't quite sure in my early 20s what I wanted to do and whether I wanted to do that for a career. Uh, so about a year or so after I finished college, um, my mom, who's a physician, uh, decided to open up a solo neurology practice. Uh, so I decided to join her uh, and work for her for a little while. Uh, I really enjoyed that, um, starting a business and making financial decisions. Um, so I decided to apply for business school with the intention of pursuing a career in healthcare administration um, and possibly hospital operations. So I supplemented my core classes in strategy, finance, and accounting with um, electives in health services delivery and financial applications. Um, and at that time, I also decided just kind of on a whim to take an elective course in data mining methods. Um, and this class really changed my outlook on healthcare and the work I wanted to do. Uh, so at this point, I started wondering how data and analytics could be used to identify inefficiencies in healthcare and inform policy decisions. Um, and so I decided to take a few more analytics classes after that. Uh, and then ultimately, after wrapping up business school at GW, I Again, decided to take a very different path than most of my classmates, and I joined the D.C. Department of Health, uh, just the Department of Health, and um, I worked on survey design. Um, I examined uh, primary care workforce shortages in the district and also did a little bit of policy and regulatory work. Uh, and then after a couple of years, I moved over to the D.C. Department of Healthcare Finance. Uh, I worked in their division of research and analytics, um, and worked on a lot of different types of projects here, um, including analyzing the effects of chronic homelessness and permanent supportive housing on healthcare utilization, um, characterizing emergency medical service super users. Um, and then about five months into that job, I decided to go back to grad school for an MPH. Um, I wanted more specialized training in quantitative methods that were specific to public health. And I chose USC because um, I felt that it would help me achieve my goals of furthering my public health education through specialized biostatistics and epidemiology coursework that was offered through the online program. Um, I chose biostatistics because I really enjoy examining trends and discrepancies. Um, it was kind of similar to the work that I was doing. Um, and then having the program online also allowed me to continue working full-time. I'm still at the Department of Healthcare Finance, uh, but about 16 months ago, I moved over to another division that works specifically with health information technology and exchange in the district. Um, and about one month into that position, I started working on my practicum all at the same time. So the Department of Healthcare Finance, where I work, has signed a data sharing agreement with the Department of Health. And I knew some of the epidemiologists there, and I had never worked with them before but wanted to. Uh, so I proposed for my practicum project to work with that team specifically um, to analyze HIV outcomes in surveillance data within the Medicaid population. So this was an opportunity for me to do a side project working with claims data, which I sadly don't do uh, much of in my current role, and it was something that was relevant to my coursework. So for my practicum, I was supervised by an individual at the Medicaid agency that was not my current boss, and the work was and is unrelated to my current role at the agency. So I ended up working with the chief epidemiologist at the D.C. Department of Health, 
um, in their HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, SP, and TB administration. And together, we conducted an analysis of HIV-positive Medicaid beneficiary claims to investigate the relationship between um, healthcare utilization patterns, which are found in claims, and healthcare outcomes, such as viral suppression, which are, find, uh, which are found in, um, in surveillance data. So from my practicum experience, I wanted to develop an increased understanding of surveillance data. Um, I want to collaborate more with stakeholders to develop data sharing standards. Um, and then I also did a little bit of research, um, conducted a literature review, um, and... Um, That's the only way I knew that she was ahead is I looked over and I said, they don't know. Um, I'm kind of hearing, some, I'm hearing somebody's voice in the background. I don't know if everybody is on mute. Um, so uh, through my practicum, I want to collaborate with stakeholders and develop new data sharing standards. Um, and then I also developed an abstract working with my supervisor um, and did a poster presentation um, at the National Sexual Health Conference. So that was pretty cool. Um, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions about my practicum offline or during the Q&A portion. Uh, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and move on to what I do currently. Uh, so the D.C. Department of Healthcare Finance you know, um, not only serves as the district's Medicaid agency, it also serves as the state health IT coordinator. Um, and those functions are undertaken by my division. So I started working here because as much as I like research and I like data, I like strategizing and building things. Uh, and health information exchange is a way for me to combine both of those passions. So I want to kick off with a couple of few facts about the D.C. Uh, about the DC Medicaid program. Uh, we cover 40% of district residents, including seven out of 10 kids. Um, we do pretty well in terms of covering the population. We rank third in terms of uh, on insurance. Uh, we also have one of the largest budgets in uh, the District of Columbia government. And in our capacity as the state health IT coordinator, uh, we administer the Medicaid EHR incentive program. Uh, we facilitate funding from CMS, uh, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services at the federal level, to support health IT projects at the local level. Um, and also, we fund infrastructure that will uh, be used by uh, Washington, D.C. providers and district residents. Uh, we also do health IT strategy development. Um, and uh, we also do a lot of stakeholder outreach uh, through um, the HIE Policy Board, whose members are elected um, uh, or uh, through the mayor. Um, so I wanted to start off just very quickly setting some, doing some level setting and actually defining what we mean by health IT and health information exchange. Um, health IT refers to the programs and services, technologies, and concepts um, that um, are used to store, share, and analyze health information. A uh, very good example of health IT is the electronic health record. And then there's health information exchange, and there's a verb and there's a noun. The verb, the actual um, act of exchanging the information is um, referred to as health information exchange. But then separately, there is the noun health information exchange, with, which refers to the entity that creates or maintains the infrastructure through which uh, data flows between providers and government agencies, between providers and their patients. So it's almost like a highway uh, through which data flows. Um, so. My role in all of this is uh, we're tasked, my division is tasked with solving a very particular problem in the district. Um, our health system is disconnected. Patients aren't connected to their providers and providers aren't connected to partners and payers and payers aren't connected to clinical information and so on. So the solution is a health system that is connected to allow providers to communicate with each other across care settings um, to deliver patient-centered and data-driven care. Um, we really see health IT as an enabler. We don't see it as the end goal, right? It's, it's not the thing that you build. 
um, but rather it's the set of tools that supports a provider's ability um, or a public health agency's ability to enhance the delivery of care in a population. Uh, so how are we going to get there? Uh, my team has a plan. Uh, one of the projects that I've been spearheading is the 2018 State Medicaid Health IT Plan, and this um, articulates the district's health IT strategy and goals um, and presents a pathway to achieving these goals uh, based on a timeline of proposed projects and programs. Um, and what we wanted to do was create a reader-friendly document that provides a concrete vision um, on how we're going to build on existing infrastructure and how we're going to expand on meaningful use of health IT tools. Um, and most importantly, we wanted to create a document that was useful not only to us, but to stakeholders and residents around Washington, D.C. Uh, the heart of the document is the roadmap section, which describes the path um, to expand and better utilize health IT and HIE in the district. Um, so you'll see kind of what we'll be working on between now and fiscal year 2021. Um, this year, we've done a lot of foundational work, such as supporting small practices to getting connected through um, uh, the EHR incentive program. Uh, we've been funding technical assistance to help them achieve meaningful use. Um, we also awarded a grant uh, to CRISP, which is one of the district's HIE entities, um, and they've uh, developed free HIE tools using this funding, including a patient population dashboard, electronic clinical quality measurement tool, um, a patient care profile, which displays demographic data and recent hospitalizations and ER visits and medication lists um, all in one place. So what we're continuing to do is getting more providers to use these tools within their existing workflow um, and make uh, improvements to the infrastructure itself. Um, so I'm happy to talk to you more about uh, the work that we're doing um, offline or answer questions afterwards. Um, but at this point, I'd like to leave you with some thoughts about getting the most out of your MPH program. Um, so first of all, uh, be honest uh, to others, yourself, and about your work. Um, I think this is, in some ways, it's a no-brainer, um, but sometimes it's just uh, good to reiterate. Um, second, really take the time to get to know your classmates. Um, I know Delcy said this during her uh, presentation, um, but these are not just the people that you do school projects with. This is really the start of you building your USC network. Um, so really take time and invest in those relationships. Um, third, I would recommend finding a mentor and going to different conferences. Um, in subject areas that interest you. You don't necessarily have to know exactly what you want to do in life um, or what you want to do you know, after this program. Um, so make sure that you're kind of getting out there and um, seeing what opportunities are available to you. Um, and use your time in grad school wisely. Um, it's a financial investment. It's really hard work. So make sure that you're getting the most, um, getting out of it what you intended to get out of it when you first started. Um, and be flexible. Be open to new opportunities and directions. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, always feel free to reach out to me. Uh, find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm always, always happy to, always happy to chat, even if I'm on the East Coast. Uh, that's what Skype is for. We can always chat. Uh, so thanks so much for having me here today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Denise, for sharing your experiences and uh, your your honest. Uh, feedback and input for um, perspective and, and current students. Next, I'd like to turn it over to Dorian Satterley. Hi. So I am Dorian Satterley, current student at the USC MPH online program. And I'll get right into it. Um, I started my career path, my current career path, um, by enlisting in the Coast Guard and I became a marine science technician. And this is the rating that really carries out the environmental protection mission of the Coast Guard. Uh, I've spent 
about a month and a half working as a federal on-scene coordinator for two task forces down in the Gulf of Mexico uh, during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And I spent seven years in the Coast Guard and started working on my Bachelor of Science in Environmental Management with the University of Maryland University College, which is the University of Maryland online college. And I started that while I was still in the Coast Guard and completed it after I got out of the Coast Guard, um, which I did following after my son was born. Um, after I completed my bachelor's, I started working for Jefferson County Public Health in Jefferson County, Washington. I, around the same time, started the MPH program at USC. Uh, my hope is to use that MPH to advance with Jefferson County Public Health, possibly move to the state level with the Washington State Department of Ecology, whom I have worked alongside with both while in the Coast Guard and at the local level at Jefferson County. And someday I would love to work in industry or possibly academia. But my options are open. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to share a couple of pictures um, with you from my time in the Coast Guard. And my slideshow is not advancing. Okay. Um, as a marine science technician, like I said, pollution response was our bread and butter. Um, these are just a couple of pictures from my time. Boom deployment training, uh, the picture on the right is the aftermath of a multiple yacht fire. That same fire uh, around the corner from that is this nesting swan, uh, some other stuff we had to be aware of during environmental response. Um, and that poor thing was probably scared to death of all the fire trucks and all the commotion around it, more so than the oil itself. And then uh, the picture on the right there is a marine diesel spill that I responded to while stationed in Seattle. Um, so when I got out of the Coast Guard, uh, my, my job searches and my educational um, goals started gravitating to environmental health and safety positions and environmental health and safety um, education. And that's kind of what drew me to look at MP, uh, Masters in Public Health options. And currently, as an environmental health specialist for a county, my main areas are in solid waste and hazardous waste enforcement. So some of my background helps me with that. But um, also do food inspections and pollution prevention. Solid waste enforcement involves permitting landfills, transfer stations, and our local biosolids facility. But most of my time is spent on residential violations of solid waste. And there's a lot of crossover between environmental health and community health when you deal with some of these. Um, you've got hoarders, illegal junkyards, rural residents that don't really have trash pickups, and that kind of thing. Pollution prevention is something I work on with small businesses that have hazardous waste streams, um, but in small enough amounts that they aren't inspected by the state. I act as technical assistance, so there's no enforcement at my level. So I can refer businesses to the state if they are violating any laws. And food inspections are kind of the more well-known side of the local jurisdiction environmental health office, at least here in Washington. And they're pretty self-explanatory. The picture on the right is me in front of bags of oyster shells because we deal with a lot of um, commercial producers of shellfish up here in Washington. And to give you an idea of, first of all, why do I do so many different things, um, we have a small we have a small county population wise, and um, so a small uh, local health office. Uh, the Jefferson County itself has a population of about 28,000 people. That's 16 people per square mile. By comparison, LA County is 5,319 per square mile. In King County, where Seattle is located, is about 912 people per square mile. So we're small and we're rural. 
And for my practicum, um, again, partly because we're small and there aren't a lot of options, but also I do have the opportunity to do something with Jefferson County Public Health going from environmental health to the community health side. And it would be working on our community health improvement plan, specifically working with rural youth on an intervention program that kind of grew out of the Washington State's mandate for marijuana prevention education for youth. Um, since we legalized marijuana in 2014, the state has kind of put it on the county to come up with an educational, um, something educate, something to educate youth about um, avoiding marijuana. Uh, I'm not working directly with that program, but this um, intervention idea came out of that program. Working with, you've got a lot of low-income youth isolated in small rural towns. I'll specifically be working in the small town of Brennan, which is in the very far south end of the county, and trying to create a, an intervention program that would be scalable to the other communities in Jefferson County. Opioid abuse is a huge issue all over the country, but rural areas in Washington State also have very high numbers. So we hope to create a program that keeps youth busy and connected and engaged. And this is some pictures of Brennan, <laughs> and there really isn't much more to it than that. That's um, the community center in the school, and then they've got, you know, a, a gas station, a couple general stores, and then it's a pretty rural residential area. <clears throat> so the other challenge I'm going to... One of the challenges I'm going to have working in Brennan is that a lot of my um, a lot of my solid waste cases are with some residents of Brennan, and I'm not the most popular county person, but I think they also realize that um, I wear a lot of different hats, and they'll be able to recognize that um, this time I'm there to help and not to enforce. Um, and then other challenges are going to be scheduling and accommodation. I think working with my current employer, but under a different um, department, they'll at least have an idea of what I need um, on both sides for scheduling. And since I'll be working with youth, I think it might be perfectly acceptable to have my youngest uh, who's four years old in tow every once in a while and do some tel telecommuting if I have to. And one of the takeaways I've gotten from the MPH online program is uh, it doesn't doesn't seem like you'd have a lot of chances to engage with your classmates or the or the staff at all. But um, I've been I've been pretty good about following them on the different. Uh, social media platforms, Facebook, um, Instagram, and Twitter. And I recently won a Twitter or a social media contest during National Public Health Week back in April by just posting with hashtags related to public health and the MPH online program at USC. And I got some free swag, including my um, second mug from USC. School, um, tech school of medicine, so that was pretty cool. But there are lots of ways to get engaged um, with other online students, and social media is a big one. Um, I've definitely friended some of my classmates on Facebook, and I'm looking forward to meeting them at commencement. And thank you so much for your time, and I will be happy to take any questions. All right, Great Dorian. Thing. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Q. Thank you. Oh no, thank you so much, Dorian, for uh sharing, uh Delcy and Denise for sharing. We'll now try to answer questions and I don't see many of them uh in the chat box, so in case you forgot to submit a question, please type it in the Q and A box in the bottom left left hand corner of your screen and hit send, and we will try and answer your questions uh, for our students. Um, 
I would like to actually uh, start off the questioning, uh, and this question would actually be for Dr. Kumar. You know, with students having so many interests in, you know, the field of public health, how would a student determine the type of practicum experience uh, to pursue? Thanks, Karina. It's a great question. Um, we really allow students to determine what kind of practicum they want to do. Ideally, it should be linked to the field or the next kind of job or organization you're hoping to land up in. Um, to get exposure there, to kind of get your feet wet, make contacts, start to network. So it's really up to the student where they would like to work and where they would like to do their practicum. Um, we have options for students to do their practicum anywhere in the world. We have several students who go overseas and do a practicum, uh, several who you know do it in their own backyard at their place of work, as long as it's something different than what they do for their job on the daily. Um, others who do it maybe at a different organization within their city um, where they're hoping to land uh, their next job or just get some different exposure. So it's, it's very much up to the student, and we, our team here helps um, facilitate those placements based on the student's interests. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Um, our next question, um, I did not complete statistics as an undergraduate uh, Bachelor of Nursing, uh, as there are, are there any stats courses I can complete to uh, be eligible for application? I can actually speak to uh, that question. Uh, that is from uh, Luis. Uh, there aren't any requirements as far as requ you're required to take a statistics course to be eligible to apply to the program. As coming into the program, students take core courses um, that not only lay the foundation for public health, but it also will allow you to touch upon the uh, different concentrations in the program. So you're not required to take a statistics course. Of course, if you have some background, it, it can definitely help you, but it's not a requirement. So if you are interested in applying to the program, uh, please reach out to your advisor or we'll have your advisor reach out to you uh, following this presentation to discuss the uh, application requirements as well as the program and hopefully get you set up for the upcoming fall. All right, so our next question, this is what tips can you share with current students uh, things you wish you knew when you were starting the program. Is there anyone that would like to start that uh, that conversation? Um, if we can, maybe answer it in the order that uh, you spoke. So, Delcy, would you mind answering that question first? Absolutely. Um, I think my biggest concern when I started was how am I going to manage everything? Like, how am I going to fit everything in? There's so much. There's only so much time in a day. And um, one thing I'd like to to say is that your your body, your circadian rhythm, your your schedule will adjust. Uh, it starts to feel really natural after a while. And um, I think as as kind of stressful as it can be at the beginning, you really just find your rhythm. And then when I finished my program, I all of a sudden just had all of this uh, free time that it was a little overwhelming in a different way. So don't let the time piece scare you. Um, it's, it's manageable. It really is. And luckily, this program is really flexible and allows you to have that uh, real engagement and and uh, put in that investment without it being so demanding on your time. Um, this is Denise. Um, so for me, uh, I had the benefit of this being my second round of grad school. Um, so I think I was a little more prepared this time um, in terms of being a little more disciplined with how I balanced work and school and um, sort of scheduled everything out. Um, I think one thing that helped me is the fact that I was on the East Coast. Um, 
I would be able to go to work. And then a lot of my classes were uh, quite late on um, on the East Coast side. So I, I would have classes at uh, 8 p.m. my time or 9 p.m. my time. Um, so I actually had a little bit of time to myself in between coming home from work and uh, doing classwork or going to class. Um, so that seemed to help. Um, and I had a very similar experience post, um, post uh, MPH um, as Delcy did. Um, you just suddenly find all this time on your hands after you graduate and you're like, you know, you're almost stressed out because you don't know how you're going to fill up all this time that used to be taken almost completely by schoolwork or, um, or your professional life. Um, so um, it's a pretty wonderful but overwhelming feeling in a different way once you're done. Um, but I would, the piece of advice I would say, give you is um, just be good about time management and make sure that you make time for yourself to do some fun things. Um, Self-care, I think, is very important and something that we neglect and take a back, you know, that tends to take a back seat pretty quickly in situations like this. Um, so, yeah, make, make sure that you take some time for yourself uh, during this process. Yeah, and this is Dorian. I, along the same lines of time, it's not that I, I wouldn't say that I wish I knew because I, I kind of had an idea, but the amount of time that I needed, I wish I knew that it was okay to find a babysitter or daycare or a way to free up my schedule, even with children. Um, and it's okay to let my kid sit on a, with a screen for a couple of hours while I get some work done. <laughs> but that was kind of the thing is um, I needed, I, I wish I knew that it's okay to um, let people help you or pay for help uh, even. So that was, that would be my answer to that question. Thank you, ladies. Again, uh, if you have any questions, Type them in the Q&A box and hit submit, and we'll go ahead and get them answered. Um, our next question, I'll di direct this to Dr. Kumar. Uh, what is the weekly time commitment for study? Um, I will be balancing parenting, small children, and shift work. Sure. Um, it depends on the number of classes you're taking. So typically per class, you can expect about 10 to 12 hours of coursework each week. Uh, most students take two classes during the term and they are working full time. But I would love to actually turn this question over to, to the students and the alums because they would probably give you uh, more accurate answers from their perspective in terms of the time Absolutely. commitment. Hi, this is Delcy. Um, I would say that that's pretty accurate. I would say, uh, so it, it kind of it's different from week to week. There were some weeks that were light, and I mean, it, it, there were some weeks when I would just do probably four to six hours, but then there were some weeks that it was closer to that uh, uh, 20 hours a week, for, and I took two classes at a time. Um, and those, I would say that the 20-hour weeks were more infrequent. They weren't as much as... Uh, it wasn't that bad. It, it, 20 hours a week sounds like a lot. That sounds really intimidating. Um, but it, I personally, I don't feel like that it took me quite as much time that consistently. Uh, I also noticed that semesters, different semesters, different classes, the biostats and epi semester was a lot more kind of learning and just trying to figure things out. So if, because I'm not as much of a numbers person, so if that comes easily to you, then that won't be as much of a challenge. But then the uh, health promotion, I think it was the health education and promotion, and then the um, healthcare systems week or semester, that one was just, there was just a lot of things to do. They weren't particularly difficult, but it was just lots of things to keep on top of. Um, and those were my first two semesters, so there was a really big contrast there that I had to adjust to. So um, yeah, I think that would be 
kind of my take on it and curious to see what my class or what you know the program meet say Dorian and Denise. Um, yeah, this is Denise. I agree. I think about 20 hours total per week seem to be the average looking back. Um, and that's going to fluctuate from week to week depending on the assignments that you have, the amount of reading you have to do. Um, and I remember the reading is designed in such a way that you do have to read <laughs> in order to make educated comments <laughs> in um, uh, the uh, – uh, on the weekly uh, commenting assignments, like usually it'll be like, a, from what I remember, uh, questions based off of the reading where you really have to reflect on what you read and then be able to think critically um, about it. Um, and then with the quantitative stuff, um, on, on the initial, uh, like the Biostat core class didn't take me too much time. I had already... Um, learn how to use uh, SAS and SPSS in previous coursework and then also professionally. Um, so that piece of it wasn't hard, but then as we got more to the EPI and Biostat track courses, that's when uh, the coursework really picked up for me and I had to dedicate a lot more time. So it'll fluctuate from week to week and then also to semester to semester depending on what your skill set is and what your interests are. And then this is Dorian, just real quick. Yep, yeah, uh, agree with the others. It depends on the course. It depends on the week. And um, But I can sympathize having kids. Like I said, um, sometimes you will need help with them. <laughs> um, just because it, it, it's the work... Um, what I found um, was I couldn't you, I couldn't wait to do everything on the weekend. I wanted to make sure I got reading done during the week. So um, if you're juggling kids, I can sympathize and don't be afraid to ask for help. Thank you, ladies, for sharing. Um, our next question. I'm hoping the practicum portion of the program will be a solid avenue in my transition to public health from finance and business. I have an MBA and an MS in regulatory affairs. What's the practicum success placement rate for someone who's not currently in public health? Dr. Kumar, can you answer that for us? Sure. 100% um, of our students get into a practicum. You're required to do it before you graduate. So, you know, working with faculty um, and our practicum coordinators and practicum director, we definitely make sure you find something that is of your interest that will work for you. So it's, it's nothing to worry about. We have affiliation agreements with over, um, I want to say over 300 sites around the world and growing. So if there's a particular agency where you want to work um, that's not on that list, feel free to reach out to us and let us know, and we can try to facilitate an agreement with them. And if you're kind of lost and not sure where you'd like to do your practicum, that's what you know your faculty are here for. Um, I do want to mention, by the way, uh, in terms of mentorship, each student in the program is assigned a faculty mentor. So that person's really there to kind of help guide you throughout your time in the program. In terms of big picture questions, what should I do for my career? I'm kind of not sure which track I want to do. I don't really know what practicum I want to do, or I'm kind of trying to decide between X and Y. Um, that's really where you can turn to your faculty mentor to get some of those questions answered, and also for their kind of network and support. You can mention interests that you have, and they often, our faculty, are very well connected with folks in the community um, and can kind of set you up with people. So it's nothing to worry about. All of our students get through it, and like I said, all of our students are working for the most part. So it is a lot to balance between work, school, and personal life. Everyone gets through it at the end of the day. Thank you so much, Dr. Kumar. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll go with one last question. And I know Delcy spoke to relationships. Delcy and Dorian spoke to relationships with classmates, and a lot of the students that uh, apply to the program don't have uh, experience with online learning. 
And I would want to ask each of you, how would you describe your interactions with faculty as an online student in regards to uh, availability and support? Hi, this is Delphi. Um, I would say that the faculty and staff were very available, very supportive. You know, I think it's just like with any schooling experience, you will find professors that you will click with more than others. And um, it, it, to me, it was very similar to my undergrad experience as it was to my, you know, they, they were just very comparable, even though, uh, even though they're, you know, one was virtual and one was in person. Uh, and it's the same thing. You have TAs that you work with and that you can engage with. And so I, I would recommend taking advantage of those relationships as well. And so um, I thought that they were very supportive, very, very accessible. And I, yeah, I, I think it thought it was great. This is Dorian. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, I have great access. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, no, please go ahead. I'll go after you. Yeah, I was just going to say I agree. We, I had good access when I needed it um, very in, in all areas, whether it was class uh, needing help with a specific subject or talking to an advisor or um, ah, I need to talk to someone about a practicum because I'm up here in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's always somebody available who could help me and call me down. <laughs> Yeah, this is Denise. I had, um, I had a similar experience. Uh, I think uh, faculty was super responsive over email, um, as were the TAs. Um, and then I, I also had meetings with faculty members via Skype. Um, so that was always helpful um, if I was stuck on an assignment or um, I just had additional questions. Um, if I had you know, career advice questions, um, I had Skype meetings for that. So, um, uh, yeah, I would agree. Faculty and TAs um, and program staff, they're there to support you. Um, so uh, they're a wonderful resource. So please use them. Thank you, ladies. I want to thank Dr. Kumar uh, and also thank Delphi, Denise, and Dorian for sharing your experiences with us today. And i also like to thank everyone who participated in today's Student Spotlight webinar. A copy of this recording and slide presentation will be available shortly after. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you again for joining us today, and have a great rest of the